So thank you very much for inviting me along to talk about reptiles in Scotland um, and how to identify them and survey for them. If this is an introduction. Um, it's the first time I've run something for reptiles for identification and surveying online, so I hope it will be useful. And normally I would do something where we'd have a day and we'd have some talking, we'd go out and look for reptiles and maybe do a bit more talking. Um, so this is basically the talking bit, but hopefully that will help you guys out and give you a start in surveying and maybe at least point you in the right direction of places that can help you take this further. Um, as Natalie said, I'm Chris Catron. Um, I've been looking at reptiles since I was about six. Absolutely love them. Um, my grandfather, who was a miner in the northeast of England, um, used to take me out looking for reptiles amongst other wildlife when I was really wee, and I fell in love with them instantly. And I've been enjoying them ever since and showing them to my children too, and to anyone who cares to come out and see them with me or listen to me talk. So I'm, I have lots of hats. Um, until recently, I was a, a trustee of amphibian reptile groups of the UK, but um, I've stood down from that role, although I do still help them out as a volunteer. Um, I'm a member of my local amphibian reptile group, um, CENTARG, um, so Central Scotland ARG, um, and I'm also now the chair of my local uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust group, which is Stirling and Click Manager. And those are probably the relevant hats for today. Before I get too much into this, I need to draw attention to this fantastic book, which you can download for free from Glasgow Natural History Society. So you'd be daft not to really. It's an amazing, it's an amazing piece of work. It's probably the most detailed book for um, sort of general public on reptiles and amphibians in Scotland. Um, not just in Scotland, in fact, it's, uh, although it covers just really Scottish species, it's more detailed for than any other book in the UK. So check it out. And I should also say that the distribution maps in this presentation are largely taken from that book. Um, also, there's lots of photographs in this presentation. They are only for use in this presentation and they've been kindly um, provided through um, various directly or through Am Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust who've been very kind and allowed me to use some of their um, training material and adapt that for this talk. A big thank you to Rachel, who I know is here. Um, she really um, was fantastic coming through with this stuff. So it's allowed me to update things a bit. And I'd ask you to check out the um, Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust monitoring webpage, which we'll talk a bit more about later. So, reptiles in Scotland. We have four, uh, four native species. Um, we have the adder, we have the common lizard. I don't know if I use, yeah, I can use my pointer. Can you see my pointer? Oh, so. Um, so anyway, we've got adder, common lizard, slow worm, which is a legless lizard, but people often confuse as a snake. And we also have the grass snake, which for a long time was thought not to be present in Scotland. The distribution maps all stopped at the border with England, as if they recognised some political boundary. Um, but uh, I, I did find one in Scotland a number of years ago, which came as a big surprise to me and also to the snake at the time when I was doing Great Crested Newt surveys. And I've looked into that further and I'm, I'm convinced that they are also a native species, at least in the south of Scotland. And in that case, they are our rarest species. And yeah, I'm just highlighting that guy. Not everybody agrees that they're native. So um, hopefully we'll manage to get more clarity on that at some point. There are other species too, though. So this is a sand lizard. And sand lizards are super rare and special. And they are native to the UK, but they are not native to Scotland. They were introduced here. We also have sliders, terrapins. Um, we have actually, well, one, one subspecies of, um, of slider was known from Scotland already, which is the red-eared slider. Um, the yellow-bellied slider is also now being confirmed from Scotland. And in fact, it's probably been here a while, but maybe been put down either as a just common slider, which is just the general species common name, or um, down as red-eared when in fact as yellow-bellied. And we also now have a third terrapin that's just recently been found, which um, I'm, I've drafted a paper for and should be published soon. Um, but yeah, basically the Chinese pond turtle has also now been found in Scotland. 
just they were. Before we get too far into anything, though, I really have to mention the leatherback turtle. It is a native species to Scotland. It um, feeds off our coasts. Our coasts are great for jellyfish and stuff. Um, and they're amazing animals, but they're probably not going to turn up on your surveys, but it's unfair not to mention them. So also in terms of protection, or legal protection, all native reptiles are protected from deliberate and reckless harm in Scotland. So that's just something to be aware of. And the sand lizard is fully protected in the UK as a European protected species, although exactly what level of protection it has in UK, in, sorry, in Scotland um, is probably uh, debatable as it is introduced here. So from here, I'm just going to go through each of our species and um, talk a bit about how to identify them also. So these are these beautiful distribution maps from that book that I mentioned previously. So do go and check those out. Um, common lizards are lovely animals and they're quite variable in terms of their coloration. That, that guy is pretty black. They live in a wide range of habitats um, and they range from um, also, well, basically all sorts of colours. There's a wonderful um, spectrum there from brown green to almost black. Um, and you also get some beautiful blue ones from time to time. And you really can get stunning ones. Um, if you want to see lizards easily and you're in central Scotland, I can't recommend Flanders moss more. Um, they love to bask on the boardwalk. So find if you, you can sneak up on them and have a look at them and watch them. Obviously, don't pick them up or anything. Common lizards drop their tails when they're frightened and that would be harm. Um, and they wouldn't like it. You probably wouldn't like it either. Um, so yeah, they're really cool. And they're um, about 15 centimetres long when they're grown up. Now here is a great comparison photo of male and female. So um, they do, you can tell the sexes apart and it is quite clear in adult uh, common lizards, not necessarily so clear in some of the other reptiles we'll talk about. Um, but males have a speckled back, they have a larger head, um, a longer tail, and they also have a penile bulge, and I've got another photo that shows that, but that's at the base of the tail, basically. Um, females have a striped back and a longer torso than the males as well, so the proportions are different. So for some more pictures of the detail on males, so that's showing their speckled back, and they can have this glorious orange belly as well. But don't pick up the lizards. These are um, professionals picking up the lizards with the right arrangements. So here we have that picture showing the penile bulge for you. So it's this area here at the base of the tail where it swells in the males, not in the females. But the speckling and stripes are usually pretty clear. And there's the pictures just showing the female stripe back again. Juveniles are lovely wee things. They're tiny. They can be the small, you know, the size of your thumbnail. They're just glorious. Um, and when they're born, they're almost completely black. So um, common lizards give birth to live young. Um, and but after a bit, or at least they do in Scotland. After a bit, they um, change colour and become bronze. And you can end up with some of the lizards. They end up with this kind of split coloration. It's really really pretty. You know where their tails perhaps a different colour than the front part of their body, and they're just so cute. And they do develop, so they do start to develop the adult markings pretty quickly, um, but it can, you know, it can be hard to identify a really tiny thing to, to gender. Moving on to our next lizard, the slow worm. So as I said, this is a legless lizard, often confused for a snake, and in fact in Scotland, in most of Scotland, the traditional common name for slow worm is actually grass snake, very confusingly, because elsewhere in the UK and in most books, grass snake as a common name refers to an entirely different species, which does happen to be a snake, but usually refers to Natrix helvetica, as it is now known in the UK. Um, so they're, they're legless lizards, um, so you can't confuse them with other lizards, but you might confuse them with snakes, um, but they do have a very lizard head. Um, they've so they've got they've got a more defined head and neck than a snake often does, um, and they have um, eyelids as well, which our snakes don't. Um, their colour is quite variable again, from grey to brown, tan, orange, red, 
copper and melanistic and older males or males as they get older um, often develop blue specks which is really cool also um, my cat Coco has just joined us she will hopefully not bother us too much but cats do eat lizards and things actually which isn't so great so mature slow worm that's managed to keep its original tail so they drop their tails too Again, don't pick up uh, reptiles, don't want to cause them harm. Um, they can grow to um, 40 centimetres or so, so they can get quite big and they're pretty chunky. So this is showing males. So the male, you can tell you can tell them apart, males and females when they get older in particular. It can be hard when they're younger, um, but males have got um, thick, heavy necks and big heads, um, which they use to um, test their dominance with each other um, and they're usually in grey or brown and they don't have distinctive stripes when they're mature and as I said they can develop blue spots as they get older. Females on the other hand have dark brown sides and they are, often have um, one or more vertebral stripes that go the, f go the full length of the body from the um, from, to the tail. Um, this is a picture showing some uh, youngsters. So again, um, slow worms give birth to live young. Um, all, so all our lizards in Scotland do that. Be an adaptation to climate. But as you can see, the, the, wee, the wee ones have that um, vertebral stripe and the dark sides as well, like the females do. Um, so they're usually yellow or gold, but they can vary and you can even get pink ones, which is pretty cool. And that's just a picture of um, an adult and a juvenile um, that I found under a stone up north. So slowworms are fossorial. They um, live in that interface between the, the top of the ground, the vegetation turf, and inside the vegetation and into the ground. So they can be quite hard to find. Um, this is somewhere like picking up stones or using artificial refugia are really, really important, but we'll talk more about those later. Um, you can, I have found over the course of my life that um, particularly gravid females, so pregnant females, um, when they're when they're quite heavily pregnant, do sometimes bask out in the open. So you can spot them at that time in their life cycle, but otherwise they are quite hard to spot without lifting things or putting down refugia. So onto our introduced lizard, the sand lizard. It's only known to occur on one place, which is cult. Now, I do verification of um, reptile records on, for various people, and sand lizards do get recorded not infrequently in Scotland. Um, but the, I think the, the issue there, and these days it's fantastic, you can submit photos and I can look at the photos and then I can identify things, which is a lot better than the past when you need to phone someone up and have a chat and try and work it out. Um, but you do get really bright green um, common lizards and I think that's where the confusion comes from but hopefully we'll go through how to identify a sand lizard and um, you guys won't fall down in, into that pitfall. Um, so it's an introduced species only known from the island of Cull. Um, it's fairly well documented the introduction and they've been monitored as well um, in terms of how the population has done. So there's about there were 39 individuals moved from Dorset um, in 1971 when this was um, not against the law. You, you cannot do this now without going through a lot of hoops and it's unlikely anyone would approve it. Um, but they're still there and they're still breeding today. This is where they are. Um, so they're actually living on an isolated sand dune and they've just remained there and their population has remained stable since 1971. Um, they haven't spread around the island at all. Um, so, and they do seem to be quite isolated there. So it's, a pretty, it's fairly contained. They're pretty cool though. And yeah, there's also just a random picture. I do like my bugs as well. And when I went out looking at the uh, sand lizards um, on call a number of years ago, I also saw loads of these guys, which are short-necked oil beetles, Melogrivicollis, and they are super rare as well and abundant on that sand dune. So sa sand lizards, they are quite different from common lizards. They've got these eyed markings called a celly um, along their bodies which common lizards do not. 
males have broad have a broad head, big head. It's a, a common factor in lizards. Males have the bigger heads, um, and they also develop these vibrant green sides during the breeding season. Females also have those eye markings that tend to be duller. Um, and the juveniles also have those eye markings. So um, if the lizard you're looking at does not have the eye markings in Scotland, it is not a sand lizard. And it is very unlikely to be a sand lizard anyway, unless you happen to be where they live and where they were introduced. And these guys lay eggs, I should say as well. So um, unlike our native lizards, which give birth to live young, they lay eggs. And so they need very particular conditions for the egg development. And coal is a bit of a sun trap compared to other parts of Scotland. And the temperature is a bit higher, as is Tyree, um, which is probably one of the reasons they're uh, managing to persist there. So moving on to snakes, the adder. So until recently, our only known native snake absolutely beautiful animals. Um, there you can see their distribution. Now these distribution maps from the book I um, mentioned um, that I've shown so far are a distribution using data from, uh, well, since the year 2000. There's also maps that go back further um, using older data. And as you, the data does seem to suggest that there has been a decline or, or a restriction in their range um, over time, unfortunately. And they camouflage very well. Um, they, they, especially in vegetation such as bracken, although they're not all, they don't always coincide with bracken. They can live places where there is no bracken, but they certainly do blend in very nicely with the bracken. And that's uh, and that's just a, a picture of an adder poking out of its hole, basically. And so they can be quite hard to spot. And this is a, an example of a, a very dark adder. It's not entirely black, but it's pretty close to being black. It's melodistic. Um, and it's um, doing something called mosaic basking, where it's basking underneath the vegetation. So this is the adder in here. Uh, really hard to spot when they do this, but this is quite a common way to find them. So you, it, you need to get your eye in, but practice really does help. Um, we're fortunate in Scotland or lucky or we've got history with Scotland in that there's uh, there's a chap called Dr Norman Morrison who lived on Lewis who was the founder of the Scottish Police Federation which he's probably better known for um, but he is also known as the Adder Man and he he studied adders in depth and published really important observations on them um, and there there used to be a fantastic website that had lots of his stuff and that seems to have gone down um, over the last couple of years but there's still a really good blog that you can read about his life there um, with regards to adders and I'd highly recommend taking a look and learning more about him I would also recommend not picking up adders they might bite you they don't like being picked up and also don't put them on your head it doesn't seem like a very good idea so adders have got a distinctive zigzag diamond pattern down their back um, that's the key ID feature and they're also the only snake in the UK with a vertical pupil, so one that goes up and down. We only have two snakes in Scotland that we're aware of, and the other one's got a round pupil. So there's one thing you can tell them apart right away. So the grass snake's got a round pupil, adder's got a vertical pupil. And they're really small. Um, really, I think they're small anyway. But they're between 16 and 70, 70 centimetres long. Um, I've got a friend who, um, he's well into his um, adders and reptiles as well and we go out herping quite a lot. Um, but when he was younger, um, his father used to um, warn him about going on to the moorland because there are these adders and he made them out to be this terrifying thing. And then one day my friend as a child found an adder and he didn't know what it was and he, because it didn't look like this horrible, terrible monster giant thing that could hurt him. Um, and, uh, and was absolutely amazed to discover that, um, that that was an adder. That was the thing he was meant to be afraid of. They generally just sit there. I mean, if you see them at all, they're hard to spot and they're often active. And in fact, for quite a lot of the summer, they seem to spend their time um, partially underground. Um, but they just sit there unless you bother them. They just sit there happily. So it is possible to sex adders, although I must caution it is very difficult. Even I find it difficult at points. It depends on the snakes, so you get clear examples, but it can really be tricky. Um, 
but it's where I mean it's a bit fun to try. Um, so males have a black zigzag, and females have a brown zigzag. But females can have a really dark brown zigzag, and males can have a very dull black zigzag. So it can be tricky. Um, and males often have a grey background after they've shed their skin, but that gets duller uh, in between molts. So um, yeah, it's not really reliable. Males are smaller though, and females are larger. Um, so that's just an example of, um, of, of males and how they can still be broad, a bronze beige colour like the females. I mean, ad the adders are actually really fairly variable in my experience in Scotland anyway. Um, I mean, you get these, you get beautiful olive ones even. Um, but yeah, they do seem to more often be brown and males and females can be brown. So it's difficult to sex them reliably. Um, females always have a brown zigzag, but it can be quite dark. And that's a ginger brown, uh, that's a ginger um, female with a brown zigzag. And they can be pretty um, ginger, like pretty reddish at points, it's really cool. And here we have a black adder. So um, adders can be melanistic and it's not uncommon. And anecdotally, it does seem to be more frequent in the north and the west. So um, yeah, and I do come across black adders in most populations that I find. These are baby adders, juveniles, and they do tend to be ginger or red. They're Really, you can see hey, how tiny it is. Sorry, Hello? I think we lost you. Separate. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Chris. I don't That's know, a, oh, don't that, know I mean, I'm sorry about me. that. Where, do you know where um, I was? You just um, introduced the, the juveniles. Okay, cool. Well, let's go back there then. I will start with that again. Apologies, everybody. My internet can be a bit variable at this time of day. Um, I've picked the best room in the house, which is why I've got a cat bothering me. Um, and there's guinea pigs in the room too, so apologies for those guys or girls as the case may be. So anyway, um, juvenile adders are the, are so cute. Like um, they are the size, you know, the size of a coin um, there and so delicate. They tend to be ginger or red, really stunning. And they're yeah, just the cutest wee things. But I just put this in here to say, they're not always ginger or red. So that adder is, you can see how small it is with the sphagnum moss there. Um, it's coin sized and that one is clearly not ginger or red and that's harder to spot. I wonder if maybe just thinking about it and I haven't really thought of this before, but I wonder if the brighter colored ones are easier to spot. Um, certainly I, I spot them like inside vegetation and stuff, um, you know, buried deep. Whereas I would find it really hard to spot that um, guy in vegetation. Uh, so where do adders live? They can be found in many types of habitat, such as heathland, moorland, coastal dunes, lowland bogs and mosses, roadside verges and railway embankments, um, oh, in many, many places really. Um, and per persecution and disturbance is a problem for this species. Uh, it's due to misunderstanding and tradition, I think, um, a bit of awareness raising would probably go a long way. Um, so the, it's sites with limited access, like MOD, Ministry of Defence Land, and nature reserves can be really useful for adders. But um, in, in Scotland, we do have quite vast extents of habitat which are suitable for adders that people do not frequently go to, um, where probably muir burn is the biggest risk to them. Um, and they do tend to live in lower densities in these areas, but I would hope that there are still, there's still a fairly good range of adders and perhaps they don't get recorded as often as they might because of where they live. Our other native snake, our rarest reptile, the grass snake. As you can see, it's got that round pupil, so you can tell it apart from the adder without needing to know anything else. But I do think it looks quite different anyway. This is a distribution map of it from taken from that book. So um, the black dots on the map are confirmed. They are definitely uh, grass snakes. And one of them is actually of a breeding site quite some time ago where they were laying eggs and youngsters were found. Um, these pink ones are possibles, so um, they are 
they are grass snakes, um, but we don't know if they were introduced there or not, uh, is the main issue. Um, and we actually do have other records further north, which you'll see on another map later. This is just the one that was available at the time the book was published. For example, you can see there is a dot at Loch Lomond, and there definitely were grass snakes at Loch Lomond, and they get reported there not infrequently. Um, but 200 baby grass snakes were introduced there some time ago. So it's, it could be that any snakes there um, are, you know, the legacy of that introduction. And as I mentioned earlier, um, slow worms in Scotland, common name in most of Scotland, traditionally has been grass snake. So when people have done uh, surveys for grass snakes using um, forms for people to fill in, have you seen a grass snake, like a grass snake, grass snake, a natrix, natrix as it was at the time or thought to be at the time, and now it's recently being reclassified as natrix helvetica. Um, that's what the people were, that's what the scientists were looking for. But the people were told, have you seen a grass snake? And they took the box, yeah, got grass snakes in my garden, but they meant slow worms. And then in Argyll uh, in particular, and the um, adders tend to be called grass snakes, um, traditionally as a common name. So again, people who have filled in surveys, um, have you seen any, uh, any um, grass snakes in Argyll? Oh yeah, I've seen them all the time, but they actually mean adders, which is a bit tricky. Whereas the one on the right hand side there is an actual, what most people in the UK these days would think of as a grass snake, uh, Natrix helvetica. And I've, I've done quite a lot of stuff on grass snakes and published things and given talks and there's loads of information on my company's website if you want to look into that further. Um, so they're usually olive green, but they can sometimes be brown or greyish, they may, um, and they can grow up to 100 centimetres long, so they are considerably larger than an adder. Um, they have large eyes with round pupils, they're very slender, adders are quite stocky, um, and they're very active. Um, these guys are, swim in ponds and water and like ditches and things, catching amphibians. And when I found one, I was actually standing on a vegetation raft on a pond doing a Great Crested Newt survey and I flushed it, which really gave me quite a fright and I almost fell in the pond. I was with somebody, so I was perfectly safe. Um, and the snake just went swimming off, which is just super cool. And I've seen them many times in other places, but it's really a real honour to see one in Scotland. So they usually have a yellow or at least a pale collar um, behind the head, which is another distinctive feature. Males are smaller and thinner, but they have longer tails, although I think I struggle to see how long a snake's tail is um, in the field when it's moving around and disappearing from me and such like. So uh, I don't think that's necessarily a helpful thing for most people um, when they're surveying. Um, and they have, but the, the males have narrow heads with protruding eyes. The females um, are bigger than the males, but they have shorter tapering tails and they have a broad arrow shaped head with their eyes recessed inside. I think those are fantastic photos. They are egg laying, which will be a limiting factor for them in Scotland, probably. They do occur quite far north um, on, in Europe, on the continent in Scandinavia, um, but the, the summer temperatures are much higher than they are in Scotland. And in fact, in the key months for egg development, there's not any overlap in terms of the range either. So it's consistently warmer there. Um, so their eggs are usually laid in, comp in compost or manure, um, in, in particularly in the north of the UK or um, and through England mostly. They don't often have natural legs, egg, egg, leg, egg laying sites um, here, but they do lay in deadwood and in peat and such in Europe where it's warmer. Um, and the hatchling juveniles look exactly like the adults, but are t absolutely tiny. I, I've seen the uh, baby grass snakes before, and they're, again, just so adorable. And that is an example of where you might find grass snake eggs. And yeah, I should say, like, um, in... In Scotland, there are reliable and quite a few records of young grass snakes and grass snake eggs in the Highlands, which is quite a long way from the Solway and the borders where they mostly seem to be found. And there's no records of adults up there. And I do wonder if perhaps they're being transported north um, in um, like hay and straw and other agricultural material that's um, produced quite in quite quant large quantities in the Solway area and then transported to the Highlands. I do wonder about that, but that's just me. Um, that's just me running away with my imagination, perhaps. 
Um, this is something to be aware of, though. Again, you shouldn't really be picking up reptiles. If you pick up a grass snake, it's going to play dead and it's going to poo all over you and you will not get that smell off you for weeks. So there's another good reason not to pick it up. There we go. That's a very polite way of saying it. Usually void foul spelling liquid from anus if captured, sometimes feign death. They're total um, uh, drama queens when it comes to act acting. Um, so yeah, if you see any grass snakes in Scotland, I would encourage you to record them. And I would, uh, there is a recording portal that you can do that um, called scottishgrassnakes.org, although of course you can record it with Twic and I'm sure I will be told. Um, and this is a more up-to-date distribution map, as I promised. Um, and um, yeah, the scottishgrassnakes.org um, portal is hosted by something called Record Pro, which is a recording system, which can be quite useful for incidental records, and I will end up seeing them at some point. Moving on to our turtles, that um, or our terrestrial turtles. Uh, this is the common slider, and that is a red-eared slider in particular subspecies. These guys, um, basically we have a, a wee explosions in their populations in Scotland, coinciding with whenever a new Turtles franchise becomes popular, um, or a new Turtles series or movie or whatever. Um, people tend to buy them and they're like, you know, wee things and put them in a wee fish tank and then they grow. They actually grow quite rapidly um, and uh, turtle genes are being studied, in fact, for longevity properties um, because they grow really rapidly and then they stop and then they live for a very long time. Um, so these guys end up, well, they, they, they grow to, you know, this kind of, so quite big, this kind of size, and people don't really want to keep them then, and they can be a bit bitey as well. Um, and then when that happens, people seem to release them into ponds and stuff in the wild. Um, and the, this, is, this is a map from record pool of um, red-eared sliders. Um, in Scotland, but there's actually, there's more than that. Um, there are other records that I'm aware of for sure that are definitely correct, um, but mainly around the central belt where people live. Um, oh, I know one in quite a remote pond actually in um, outside of Comrie. So they're non-native. Um, the species is Trachemis scripta, um, and there's three subspecies, as I mentioned. There's Elegans, the red-eared slider, there's Scripta, the yellow-bellied, and there's Trusti, the Cumberland slider. Um, both the red-eared and the yellow-bellied um, do definitely occur in Scotland. Um, I don't think anyone's found Cumberland yet, but um, they're a bit rarer in the pet trade. So they originate from um, Mexico in southeastern and central America, USA, and they're not able to breed in Scotland due to our low temperatures, they're egg-laying. Um, but they are highly invasive in warmer countries. In fact, they were included in the top 100 invasive uh, species in the world um, with, from IUCN, and they can live up to 40 years. So even though they can't reproduce here, if someone puts out one of these guys at the age of five when they might be fully grown-ish, then it could be there for another 35 years. Now, this is a new one. Um, the, I've got a paper drafted that will hopefully get published at some point in the not too distant future on these guys. So this is the Chinese pond turtle um, and until this year they had not been recorded in Scotland. Um, they were, they are known from I think two years ago-ish from um, the Republic of Ireland. So they are in the area as it were, um, but they do definitely occur in Scotland, it transpires. Now these are have become a popular alternative to the um, common sliders, so the red eards and the yellow bellies that I mentioned before, because they don't grow quite as big. Um, so they've become quite popular in the pet trade. They are um, native to China, Taiwan, and the Korean Peninsula. People used to think they were native to Japan as well, but genetics have found they were introduced there. Um, and they're endangered. Um, so IUCN classify them as endangered. And their trade in, is restricted under CITES as well. Um, they're not able to breed in Scotland due to low temperatures, and they live over 20 years. So again, they could still be in a pond for a long time. 
And this is a citizen science project to just get a better handle on where um, turtles are in the UK. So I'd encourage you to check that out and um, log your turtles with them if you come across any. Certainly record them somewhere. Again, Twic is a great place. So thinking briefly about threats. Um, Development is a threat to reptiles. Um, the bulldozer going through without checking for reptiles could easily kill them. Um, maybe less so on things like wind farms, though, so it's worth considering the type of development. And in fact, wind farms can create quite good habitat for reptiles, depending on how things are done. Um, and, and they do end up basking on the tracks, and at least those tracks are not commonly used by traffic, and you can have science to look out for them. Um, and yeah, uh, railway is another um, example. So even when they have to reinstate or repair railways, um, there very often you have reptile populations along the embankments like this slow worm, which I was moving out of the way of some railway works. And again, don't pick up reptiles. Um, afforestation. So um, lots of our uplands in Scotland, um, which can be quite good reptile habitat, especially for adders, get planted up with non-native commercial trees for forestry, which of course has a, a, an important role in our economy and everything, but it does have an impact on the reptiles living there. So um, adders in particular do not do well in commercial forestry areas, they get excluded quite quickly, although they will live in clear fell areas. Um, but uh, common lizards, they can persist in rides and things uh, for a while. Um, and slow worms, in, in my experience in Scotland, don't tend to um, often be found in forests. Yeah, that, that, so that, that picture is showing the forest, not the turbines. The turbines are not causing problems to reptiles. Um, Muirburn, I mentioned it earlier, is probably, is, I think that's a really big risk to, and a big threat to, um, our reptiles. Um, this is often done at the time of year when um, adders and other animal, other reptiles are just coming out of hibernation, or maybe they are still hibernating, and they're very sluggish. And you know, birds struggle to get away from this kind of thing. Um, reptiles really don't have a chance. And persecution still happens in some areas. Um, again, I think that's um, really. A lack of awareness and understanding of adders in particular, um, and as people learn more about them and that they're actually pretty safe, um, don't pick them up, then hopefully that won't be an issue. And yeah, the wind farm tracks might not be such an issue for adders, but roads are. Um, so this is an adder I found on a road where the, the adders themselves live in have a hibernation, hibernation site right next to the road and when they emerge from hibernation they tend to bask on the road and it's getting busier and busier and um, that's sadly becoming a more common site. Moving on to reptile surveys. Um, this is me some time ago with before lockdown with shorter hair. Um, doing a reptile survey for a development. Um, there are, there's a lot you can read about reptile surveys and, well, and um, a lot of detail on it. I'm not going to be going into that detail today. I'm going to talk about how you can get involved as a beginner, um, getting out there looking for reptiles. Um, but if you did want to take it further um, at the moment, I think, this remains the only uh, reptile survey and, and guidance that's current um, out there. And up to date, um, and it's uh, it's supported as you can see by um, Arg UK, Frog Life, the um, Herp Society of Ireland, Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust. So uh, everyone's on board with it. It's aimed at peatland, but it works for other places too, as long as you take into account um, use some professional judgment with the, the different habitat types. There was this fantastic publication. Um, the Reptile Mitigation Guidelines published by Natural England in 2011, but it was withdrawn very quickly, although you can still find copies of it on, um, on the darker parts of the internet. Um, so it's not official, obviously, but it is a really good read. Um, Frog Life published um, th this, this guide, which is really good actually for volunteers and sort of people who are doing it um, more casually. I'd highly recommend it. And going a bit further back in time, this is a really good book which brings together a lot 
lots of non-Fabians and how to survey for them and um, look after them and all sorts, which is a good read, which used to be available on the JNCC website. I'm not sure if it still is, I've not checked recently, but hopefully so. You can still get hard copies, but they tend to go for a bit of money. Um, and then this is going even further back, um, which is what I started out with as uh, um, a professional person, I guess, um, although I've been doing ad hoc surveys myself for a long time, um, uh, published by Frog Life in 1999, and it's still um, a really useful resource, actually. Now, the next part is about reptile surveys, and a fair bit of it um, I've cobbled together from some new slides that were provided very kindly by Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust um, from uh, Rachel here, got them to me, um, and uh, Jim Foster and John Wilkinson were very helpful too, I'm sure others, uh, and I really appreciate it. And I've also used some slides that are older that, um, and I've adapted bits and I've added some of my own, but hopefully it will be useful. But I should say there's this Saving Scotland's Amphibians and Reptiles project, which I'm really excited about, and I think it's going to give us lots of opportunities to get involved um, with learning more about our, our Scottish reptiles um, and hopefully protecting them better. Before you do a survey, though, you need to think about health and safety and do a risk assessment. So you need to know where you're going. You need, yeah, carry out a risk assessment with the knowledge of where you're going, the activities you're going to be undertaking, particular site risks. Well, you need to know whether or not you're going out at day or night. Um, for reptile surveys, you're probably not going out at night. But then again, you might have a site that's really far away. You might be doing it in the middle of summer. And so you have to get up at like midnight so you can get up that hill for um, three in the morning when the others are basking. It's, uh, that sounds challenging. Um, you, could, you need to identify the hazards on your route and at your survey site. You should use a buddy. So, you, I mean, I would personally say go out with somebody else. Um, that's the best thing to do and make sure that someone else knows where you both are. Um, and, and also it's fun. Um, and different people spot different things. Um, so I, I find reptile surveying to be a sociable um, activity really most of the time. But if, but certainly have a buddy that knows where you are, even if you are out by yourself. I also like if you're going really remote places, spot devices which like link to satellites and people can check you are becoming increasingly affordable for members of the public. Um, agree check-in times and contact details. Carry a mobile phone, although mobile phones still do not work everywhere. Um, one of my um, adder hibernation sites that I've been monitoring for a long time now, um, goodness, like 10 years, excellent, 10 years this year, um, they, they still doesn't have a phone signal there. So, Some other considerations, uh, general safety of the area. Adder bites and other medical issues, allergies and things like that. And you can be allergic to adder venom. And if that's the case, then it can really be quite a serious thing to be bitten by an adder. Um, although if you cover up with things like genes and stuff, it really makes it unlikely an adder is going to be able to bite through. And as long as you're not picking them up and doing silly things, you should be all right. If a snake starts like looking active at you and maybe st and even starts hissing, you know you're upsetting it and you should just go away. That's what it's telling you to do doesn't want to bite you, wants you to go away. Um, be aware of the weather, so there can be all sorts of different conditions, that's going to affect your survey too. Uh, terrain, so um, rough grounds, steep ponds, other water, other animals, livestock can be um, a, a, an issue that you should definitely consider. Other site hazards like tanks and bikes and guns and broken glass, um, all sorts of things could be there. And it's best to get permission to visit. Um, I know that in Scotland you can go most places. Um, there are restrictions. It's not a blanket roam everywhere thing. And it's worth reading that in detail. But it's always best to have permission. Um, it makes people a lot happier. And they might have good information for you anyway. Like farmers and gamekeepers, gamekeepers in particular, are often quite aware of uh, reptiles. In fact, gamekeepers certainly in the past used to record adders in their game bags and things and their records going back. So the can, estates can be really helpful. Oh, and yeah, consider insurance. And if you are doing surveys and a member of something like your local amphibian reptile group, then as long as you're following their rules and protocols, then you should be covered by their insurance. And I'm sure the um, Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust when, with their surveys and things too will be managing that, but you'll need to be also everything. What drives reptiles? 
thermal regulation. Um, reptiles can't maintain their body temperature um, in the same way as many mammals and birds can. Um, they do rely on external heat sources. Feeding, so they need some th things to eat. Mating, reproduction in general. So thermal regulation. So they bask in things, as I said, sometimes on the top of vegetation and very often partially. So really important for reptiles is a mosaic of habitat, but like different micro habitats. So the basking places often bare ground, although um, more often than not, I think I find adders basking on moss um, that's exposed in the air vegetation. Um, and in fact, you can even, or I can note, I can see places where they've regularly been sitting over a long time, and you can see sometimes their little tracks that they take from their home to get to their basking spot. It's very cool. Um, a suitable aspect, so generally south facing, and they'll move around during the day depending on where the sun is. Um, topography, so undulating, um, helps, and that gives them lots of different aspects. Feeding. So they need habitat and vegetation features suiting their prey. So lizards tend to eat invertebrates. Snakes tend to eat other vertebrates. So grass snakes um, specialize in amphibians. Adders um, mainly eat mammals. In fact, they often eat mammals and then occupy their holes. Um, but they do also eat reptiles. And in fact, they also do eat amphibians too. They're fairly Mating. Here we've got some uh, lizards mating, adders mating, and adder dances and things can be really spectacular if you're ever lucky enough to see them. Reproduction. So egg layers, introduced lizards, grass snake. Um, so in Scotland, the only egg laying lizard is the sand lizard and it was introduced here. And grass snakes lay eggs. The rest of them give birth to live young. So common lizards give birth to tiny little lizards. Slow worms, tiny little adders, tiny little adders. Oh. So egg layers need egg laying sites. So could be bare ground. I mean, basically the reason the sand lizards are where they are on call is because it's the right habitat for them to lay their eggs and it's um, a warm enough place. Rock crevices, maybe not so much with things that we have here in Scotland. Warm places, so compost heaps, will undoubtedly be important for grass snakes um, and manure piles too. Live bearing um, reptiles need to thermoregulate in cooler habitats, live bearing reptiles. What is good reptile habitat? Loads of different places. So lowland heathland is ideal for all reptiles. Moorland with gorse scrub. Heathlands and bogs, uh, log piles, and it's there it says especially in summer. To be honest, um, a lot of my the sites that I know best for like adders are bogs and things, and you can see them in February, March. Um, so log piles can be good basking spots and used for protection. Uh, woodland glades rather than others. Uh, vegetated coastal cliffs and dune systems. Um, tussocky rough grassland and set aside field margins. Railways and road verges, as I mentioned, are often very good, but not often possible to survey as a volunteer. I'd like to get within the particular area of a railway, you need to have particular qualifications, follow particular protocols and be given permission and all that kind of thing. Um, so stay away from railways. Um, it's kind of funny because as a kid, um, my grand focus lot line um, looking for reptiles and amphibians and um, we would just get off the railway when the railway's coming. Um, I now recognize, especially now that I have my own children, how dangerous that was. Um, and these days railway lines are fenced off for a reason. Manure heaps are good for uh, grass snake egg laying. I should say there's similar restrictions on motorways and things as well by the way to railways. So anyway, yeah, manure heaps good for grass snakes. Allotments can be really great as well, particularly for slow worms in my experience. And rare field reptiles, all sorts. And I mean, they're amazing for invertebrates and plants and yeah, just amazing sites. Reptile survey methods. So 
how do we find them? And bear in mind, this is really aimed at, um, at, at a sort of relative, you know, volunteer level. Um, if you want to read more detail about other techniques and things, then check out those references from earlier. So reptiles warm up by basking or lying under warm objects. And reptile surveys should ideally an artificial refugia. And this, this is really important. Um, so um, I and people I know who are more experienced with reptiles will find a lot more reptiles looking for them than with artificial refugia. And there's a danger with artificial refugia that you'll put those down and you'll focus on those and you'll just go to those and check them without looking around. Um, so if you are using them, you need to at least be checking in between two. Um, and as a general tip in my experience um, with artificial refugia, um, you'll generally find slow worms underneath them. and on top usually by the coroner ready to jump into vegetation um so in fact approaching artificial refugia with binoculars is not a bad idea and avoiding disturbance and seeing if you've got anything before they has a chance to run away um and i don't find that adders use artificial refugia very often but they do certainly use them and i think in populations with high density you probably do find quite a few that way but most scottish populations are really low density um and i don't find it to be very effective whereas looking for adders can be very very effective all species can be found using google search Artificial refugia really greatly increases your chances of finding slow worms. You probably will not find slow worms, or you may not find them very easily, or very many of them, without artificial refugia, or already being refugia on site, like big flat stones or old bits of wood or whatever. Obviously, be careful when picking up uh, debris, it could hurt you. And as I said, always search while you're walking between your refugia. And practice really does help when you get your eye in, it really does help. Best time of year, is, although it can be pushed kind of into May up here. Um, reptiles are most active and visible then coming out of hibernation and they're getting into breeding condition. They're all and they're concentrated by their hibernation sites where they disperse over summer and then they come back in autumn. Um, the weather is cool, so they need to bask for longer. So you've got more time to spot them when they're charged up, they're really hard to find. And as spring becomes summer, um, survey becomes only possible for short periods of time. And then when autumn arrives, survey conditions improve again. So reptiles surveys are bad. As I mentioned, some adders kind of go underground in the middle of summer, so it can be really hard to find. Um, this is a survey, uh, sort of a timetable of um, when the reptiles in Scotland are active that's taken from that um, RUK reptile survey guidance. Um, so it does vary between species, um, and adders can become active quite early, um, certainly in February. You can even see them when there's still snow on the ground on a good day. It's pretty cool. Um, and here's a useful thing that kind of breaks down what's going on at different times of January. Well, December to January is not a good time for the reptiles. Most of them are hibernating. Um, Spring is the best time. That's when they're coming out of hibernation, um, mating. Um, middle of the summer, not so good. And then into autumn, better again. Although, as I said, slow worms, um, gravid females do bask in the open um, sometimes more in the sort of getting into the beginning of summer. So there is a wee window there for slow worms. Best time of day um, in spring. It's great. It's super survey times. It's between 11 in the morning. You don't need to rush around or get up too early. Late spring, uh, mid morning, 9 to 11, still very civilized. And late afternoon, 4 to 6. Summer, short periods in the morning, between 7 and 9 and 6 and 8. I disagree with that in Scotland um, with the difference of our day length. Um, I think you need to be up earlier than that in a lot, of point, a lot of the time in the summer. You know, you're talking about just after dawn, which can be really, really, really early. Um, and hot weather can produce totally negative results. Hot weather is not your friend in summer. Sunny days in spring are your friend. Um, time of day varies with the weather as well. So there's no clear cut way of defining right or wrong weather, but there's certainly weather that you've got a better chance. So strong wind and heavy rain are not generally good. 
any other conditions can be good. Now it says strong wind heavy rain can be no, not always good. I've actually had really great success using um, refugia in um, unusually windy and rainy conditions in summertime. So you just, yeah, you never know. This is best. Um, and late spring, early autumn, it's better to go out when th there's actual sunlight. Blue skies are great in that time of year because um, it's still very cold air temperature. Cloud and overcast um, conditions force reptiles to bask longer. So. And sunshine after rain is really good. And the first sunshine after dull overcast weather is fab. And extended periods of hot, dry weather are not good. Um, this is a diagram that I really love that was in the pack from another an old survey that, that has changed or isn't operating anymore, but I think it's such a good visual representation. So although there's not you didn't, there's no right or wrong weather per se, um, this diagram shows the kind of weather you might want to be aiming for and the time of day at different points through the year to find reptiles. It's really handy. So sunny in spring, sunny in autumn, cloudy-ish in, in April and September, and then through the summer, um, you're, you're better looking really early in pretty poor conditions in the middle of the day. Visual searching. So you to find to spot them visually, you walk slowly and you scan sunny sides of vegetation and you try and keep the sun behind you or to your side and you tune your eye into vegetation interfaces so where um, one type of habitat becomes another or where there's an area of bare ground and then it becomes sort of um, structured heather um, that's that's where you're going to find them at the interfaces They rarely are far from dense cover for protection. As I've said, actually, um, they will bask under or partly covered by vegetation as well. And here we have Trevor Rose, who is a fantastic herpetologist, um, looking for reptiles, and he spotted something there. Here is my son, Ross, um, who has spotted an adder, which is there. And uh, Ross will happily tell everybody he doesn't understand why people are scared. Uh, so Ross is now five. Um, look for sheltered spots that act as sun traps. So in a dense place, look for that spot where the sun's going to get in and, it's, and such. So I think that's probably why they're often on moss, when, in my experience, the adders. Um, this is a potential hibernation site at eight o'clock in the morning, nine degrees, partial sun, it's March. And there's a load of adders there. And how do you tell a hibernation site? There's lots of holes, um, south-facing sunny location above the water table. That's why in bogs and things, there's quite limited opportunities for hibernating. Um, dead bracken can be good, and so can uh, gorse cover somewhere to shelter. Another thing to look out for are sloughs, so shed skin, um, especially after the coming of hibernation. Um, this is my son, Logan, who is eight, and he loves finding sloughs. Um, we found that one at um, the hibernation site I was mentioning that's been, I've been looking at for 10 years and was so excited he had to take it to school. Where, and certainly not adders. Artificial refugia, the other survey type. Um, corrugated metal is regarded as the best type, although it can be very impractical to take out places. Uh, roofing felt can be good as well. Um, that's what I generally use because it's easier to take to remote places and stuff in a rucksack. And you can try other things too. Lift up wood, you might find something there. Just be careful of splinters and whatnot. Um, so the recommended size here is about 70 by 70 centimetres. I actually use smaller ones myself. I use, uh, I think, which are size that I can fit easily in rucksacks, quite a few of them, and I find them to be effective. Because even uh, felt is, is heavy for um, <laughs> when you've got a lot of it. Um, choose sunny locations away from public view and livestock. Press down close to the ground, um, next to deep cover. 
paper or edges of dead vegetation, don't just leave it resting on top of stuff, get it pressed right in there or it will not be used and it might blow away too. Um, obviously you do need to get permission to put refugia down, that's not something that would be covered by the access code, I don't think. Um, I cert and landowners certainly would like discovering squares of um, rubbish as far as they're concerned around their land if they don't know what it is. Um, don't put it on bare ground or with a sparse cover. Um, lift and replace your fuchsia carefully, taking care not to squash any retreating animals, very important. Um, use a stick or adder-proof glove if necessary to ensure safety. Here's an example of a corrugated metal sheet, sometimes called tins, um, pressed down into vegetation. Old rusty tins are often more effective and you can find them out there for, uh, already. Um, corrugated bitumen is sometimes used as well and can be effective, called onduline. Um, here's a, a roofing felt uh, being used, and you can see actually the lizard is just on the edge there, ready to run away. Where should you put them? Um, you should think about isolation and sun exposure, so aspect, slope, shade level and whatnot. Vegetation structure and the surroundings are where the reptile is going to come from, are they going to use it? Um, the vegetation underneath it, um, interference risk from the public. Um, see. So in this case, that's the kind of zone you're looking at putting your refugia right next to that interface, just, yeah, just on it. Some practical points. You need to allow time for them to, for them to, the refugia to be found by reptiles and used. So at least two weeks of good weather is recommended. Um, I would say try four weeks if you can, if you can, it's even better. Uh, create a map by recording locations using GPS. Always do that visual search between the refuges. You'll probably find more. Sorry, Chris, now you're breaking up again. If they find the refugia, so it's best to put them down about two weeks before you're going to use them. Sorry, um, Chris, we, I, I think we missed uh, what we just okay. said. <laughs> Sorry, oh, really wonder. sorry. No, no, um, don't worry. Uh, we, we, it's been, um, perhaps maybe turn the camera off, that might help. I'll give that a go. Thank you. Um, I think, where did you get to? I think you just mentioned the map. So, yeah. so do I need to go back, back one? Just, just one, yeah. That's good. Thank you. So when you're placing the um, artificial refugia, you need to think about um, insulation, so sun exposure, um, aspect, slope, shade, vegetation structure in the immediate surroundings and the vegetation underneath, any interference risk, um, the safety of people, pets and livestock. And in this case, this is the area that you'd be looking at. Um, some practical points. Uh, you need to allow time for the reptiles to find the refugia, so at least two weeks of, uh, in advance of your surveys. Um, I would recommend four weeks if you can manage that. Create a map recording locations using GPS so you can find them again. Always search between the refugia, like I've said. Um, you might, you're probably going to find more reptiles that way, certainly as you get more experienced. Re reposition them if vegetation underneath dies off substantially or becomes colonized by ants, although you do find um, slow worms and ants and associated. Uh, can always be a problem. I actually find quite a few like rare invertebrates underneath the refugia as well, so you can always look out for other things. Um, high refuge densities will increase your detection rates, particularly of juveniles. And here is someone who's made a far nicer map than I could possibly do hand drawing, um, and it's to be commended. I would personally just take GPS points and make a map using the many digital resources available nowadays. Also, ARGs have access to this thing called ARGWeb, this online portal. Um, you can pick up other random stuff that you find out and about, just be very careful not to injure yourself. Um, so what can you do with this knowledge of surveying reptiles? Well, you can get involved in the National Amphibian and Reptile Monitoring Programme, which is where um, a lot of this has come from. And again, I'm very grateful. And this is being overseen by Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust. 
And it, there's all various surveys that you can get involved with there. And also it, um, they're doing genetic work on sloth and things so if you find even dead animals it, it's worth contacting amphibian reptile conservation trust um, so in terms of the national reptile survey it involves carrying out six visits um, four between march and june and two mid-august to october um, you, you need to try to survey all routes and artificial objects within a site and maintain consistent effort and that will help us understand distribution and much better and populations maybe a bit um, so that is saying the same thing. You can also get involved with ARG UK, Amphibian Reptile Groups of the UK. It's an umbrella organisation that supports local amphibian reptile groups. So um, you can go to the website and find the one that's appropriate for you. And there's a map showing where they're scattered around here. But some of these ARGs operate over very big areas. So the dot doesn't necessarily represent how dispersed the membership might be. And volunteers are um, always needed. And it's a really fun uh, way to socialize with people and meet new people. So you are awesome. And as I mentioned, this is Saving Scotland's Amphibians and Reptiles project. And there are Rachel, there's Rachel's email address if you want to get in touch with her or check out the website to learn more about this exciting project. There are other uh, ways to get involved. So as I mentioned, there's local amphibian and reptile groups. That was a training course that I ran for Central Scotland Amphibian and Reptile Group at one point. Um, and there's local ARGs scattered all over the place, and you can actually to get um, especially these days where you're allowed to again. Um, Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust, I've already mentioned. Frog Life is another charity that does fantastic um, work for um, amphibians and reptiles in terms of training, habitat management, um, public engagement. Uh, I would recommend checking them out too, and they're very active in Scotland. And just mentioning SOS Tobago because our turtles that eat the jellyfish in our sea breed there, so you might want to volunteer. Um, in Tobago, where the weather will be better than in Scotland, almost certainly. So Conservation Trust, get involved with frog life. Record. And there's a couple of particular surveys that are worth checking out as well. Um, so there's the Make the Adder Count survey where you monitor hibernation sites. Um, and there's a link there. So ARG UK um, is doing that. And there's also a partnership project on the go at the moment, um, a Scottish adder survey repeating work that was done back in the 90s, which is super duper exciting and should give us a snapshot of how our, popular, how our adders are now and that we should be able to compare with the best. And yeah, go see giant leatherback turtles and help their babies survive in the beach and the sun. I would like to do that sometime. So some useful links there for you. There's the ARC UK website, ARC Trust, Record Pool, where you can put incidental records and such like, um, SOS Tobago and Frog Life. And yeah, as I say, if you're just doing casual stuff and you want to put your data somewhere, Record Pool is a good place, although so is Twic, of course, and I'd like to record access of data if you join up um, with Record Pool and see where things are as well, which can give you encouragement to survey. Maybe you want to go somewhere where they've been found before. Maybe you want to go somewhere that no one's found anything and be the first to find something there. And again, I highly recommend uh, getting this book. It's free online and it's amazing. Also, um, there's lots of things available on the Caledonian Conservation website. I try to make as much available for free as possible. Um, when I do things, if I publish papers, I always get agreements to get a free, have a free access copy on my website. Um, I'm just not always the most, um, I'm not always the best at updating it, especially in summer. And that's me. That's a lovely baby adder. Um, I love showing how red they can be. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>